Our text is taken from Genesis 22, of which let me just re read verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. It was just another day in his long life. If you may recall, Abraham by this time was well over a hundred years old now. And yet today a messenger of God disturbed his routine with a very incredible, we might even say an awful directive from the highest authority. Go and sacrifice your son Isaac. Whoa, wait a minute. Can this be? Before we go deeper into that, let's remember who Abraham is that he was receiving a message from God was not so new for him in his life. In fact, in his 100 plus years, he had several incredible encounters with God. First, you may recall that he was called from his country, which was there over in what's now Iraq, somewhere, Ur of the Chaldees, it says by God to just leave his country, leave his people, to go to a place unknown that he would show him. And together with that was some incredible promises. He would have many descendants, from him will come a, a great nation, and through him will all the nations of the earth be blessed. And then later on, after he had entered the promised land, it had been there for many years, God showed him the stars in the sky and said, can you count them? So shall your children be. And he, he, he confirmed that promise again by entering into a covenant with Abraham in the manner that was done at that time. And then still later, he gave the same Abraham a sign, a sign of circumcision to confirm the promise of many descendants because, you know, it must have been getting pretty hard for, for Abraham at this time. It says he was 99 years old at this time, but God's still assuring him, I, I wasn't kidding you, I wasn't lying, you will have a son. And maybe you recall when Abraham and Sarah received three visitors to their tents, three visitors on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, who made very clear to them and said, at this time next year, you will have a son. And Sarah herself, being in her 90s, laughed. Now, though these different messages were spread out over several de decades, this visit this time in our text today was not a first for Abraham to hear from God. Now by this time in this visit, the promised son was born. Isaac was now, had grown to some years. And we can imagine that Abraham must have been content happy with how things actually turned out in accordance with God's promises, perhaps thinking that now he can rest in peace. He has seen it come to a fulfillment. But this day comes the message. Go, take your son Isaac and sacrifice him. Now what is going on here? Why should God say such a thing? Would you pray with me? 
Almighty God, Heavenly Father, everything you have caused to be written, you have written for our learning and for our sake. We pray that this morning you would enlighten us, that we would indeed learn, that our minds might be taught and enlightened by your Spirit, and that our lives might be transformed, that we might walk in your way and in your will. For Jesus' sake, amen. So why did such a message come to Abraham? In this very important chapter in the life of Abraham, it's a very important chapter, if you will, in the book of the Bible, Genesis 22, but very important in Abraham's life, and a very important chapter, we could say, in the, the unfolding of salvation history that is, is, is um, laid out before us through the expanse of the, the Holy Scriptures. And this very important chapter is introduced with these very simple words sometime later, or after these things, God tested Abraham. Now, I think we all know God didn't need to test Abraham to know what was in his heart. He knows what's in our hearts. And God also, I think we know, does not take some sort of sadistic delight in bringing agonizing trials upon the children he loves. So why on earth did God test him like this? And I think we can at least say certainly two things. First of all, Abraham is being tested for the good of Abraham and for the sake of his descendants coming after him. You know, in several places the Bible makes it very clear to us that our faith is purified by trials, just like gold is refined by fire. Such trials teach us that faith is not some convenient means by which we, we get all the things that we desire. No. But it's this confident trust in God that allows God to be God, that says, not my will, but yours be done trusting that God is good and that his will is good. So in the verses, if we look to um, James chapter 1 and the verses that precede what we read this morning, starting at verse 2 of James chapter 1, we read this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, God tests each and every one of us, the children whom he loves, as he knows best and what's best for us, for our own good. Such trials and testings can keep us from going astray in our lives as Christians. And I think that every believer who has been through trials or through a testing of their faith can attest to the fact that God brings about good when you get to the other side of that. So what we see in Abraham here, Abraham's faith indeed set the standard of trusting in God even when things don't seem to be going right. A standard that would be a model for his descendants after him, even all the way down to us today, who we know ourselves to be children of Abraham too, by faith. So that's the first way in which we can make sense of what God was up to here on this day. But what is going on here on this day, perhaps 4,000 years ago, in a semi-arid region of the Middle East, off the radar skis, 
screen of the main events of that time, because it wasn't in the, you know, the centers of power like in Egypt or Persia or anything. But what was going on here is a lot bigger than Abraham. It's a landmark event in God's working throughout history to reverse the life-destroying effects of man's fall into sin. It's bigger than Abraham. It's bigger than all the descendants of Abraham. It's bigger than this time slot in history. God was here at work. He was on the move. So with that in mind, let's dig deeper into this historical account that we have before us. In verse 2, we're told these words. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. You see, God here is intentionally highlighting, this is your son. I, I know, it's, the, it's your only son, that son that you love so much. Yes, him. Take him. Talk about a shock to throw your, your routine, ordinary day into turmoil. For us who are looking back from the perspective that we have of the, the whole of Scripture, we can recognize in these words, your only son, your beloved son, something that echoes to the very central message of Scripture, to the, to the very center of the gospel. Your only son, the son you love. Where have we heard such words before? We heard it again today in our gospel lesson at the baptism of Jesus. What did it say? And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And what about last Sunday? Do you remember the gospel lesson last Sunday, Transfiguration Sunday? And we were told a, a voice came out of the cloud and said to the disciples, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Or John 3.16. God loved the world so much that he did what? He gave his only son, his only begotten son, his one and only son. And so here, the message comes, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. That's all. No explanation. God tested Abraham. The inner turmoil of Abraham is not detailed for us, but I think we can perhaps at least try to imagine a little. But yet with all that must have been going on in his mind, we hear it said that he got up early the next morning, he prepared the firewood and all, he got his two servants and took his son and set out on a three-day journey. Imagine the thoughts, the prayers in his heart as they walked that day, camped that night, walked all the next day, camped another night, continued walking the next day. And you know, when it gets near to the mountain, there's a touch of loneliness to this whole event. As he tells the two servants, you remain here with the donkey. The rest of the way, it was just father and son, whom he loved. Throughout this account, father and son are front and center, as we read. And fathers, I think you can sense perhaps a bit what must have been in the heart of Abraham at this time. And mothers, I know you can too. Twice in our text we read, and the two of them went on together. 
father and son together bonded in love. And I think it's important that we know what's not said in so many words, but it's said in the whole context that there was another father there. Abraham's father was there too, loving his son very much as they climbed that hill. And for the rest of the way, they, they would have no donkey to carry the firewood. So in an especially impacting part of the story, the firewood, which was to be used to consume the sacrifice, was carried how? It was placed by Abraham on the back of his son Isaac that Isaac might carry that firewood up the hill. That firewood on which he was to be sacrificed as God commanded. Dear friends, as we enter, we've now entered the season of Lent. And we see this morning that Good Friday, which is where we're headed, didn't just happen by, by some set of random circumstances that came together in 30 AD when perhaps the Pharisees and Sadducees just said, well, we've had enough of this, let's, let's be done with him. No. As we journey up the hill to Mount Calvary, as we journey on our way to Good Friday, we see this morning that it was all according to plan. Clearly known to God, even on this remote day back in history, in a remote place where a father and a son ascended together the hill to offer a sacrifice with the son Isaac carrying the wood on which the sacrifice would be made. Dear friends, if we could just stop and pause a second. Now look at this book. What is this book, this Bible? What do we really have here? You know, I have to tell you that I find here one of the most powerful testimonies among so many for any doubting mind that here we have something that is not just like any other book. This is not any other book. This is the word of someone who knows history before it happens, someone who has history in his hand, someone who is working in that history with an amazing purpose and plan such that he can carry out something 2,000 years to point ahead to something that is at the center of his purpose. So then we, we come to these words that I think can, can bring you to tears when they really hit home. Isaac says, Father, yes, my son. He says, I, I see the fire and I see the firewood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How must have dad felt? But here we have in Abraham a man who has encountered the grace of God over and over again for a long time. And he had come to learn how great God really is. He can do things that you could never imagine. And so Abraham answered him very honestly, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I don't think he had a clue what God was going to do. But he had that kind of faith. Sometimes, dear friends in Christ, that is the most that any of us can say from within the midst of our trials, when we are right in the middle of such testing, the most we can say is, 
God will provide. I, I don't know how. I can't see how. I don't know when. But this I know. God will provide. And the two of them went on together. Father and the son he loved. We come to verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid wood in order. And just try to imagine Abraham's thoughts, his silent prayers that, that he's praying, how he's crying out in his heart as he's going about these tasks, making the altar, setting the wood. But the moment came and we read, he bound Isaac, his son. The son he loved. The son of promise that he waited so long for until he and Sarah were too old to have children. But yet God gave them Isaac, the son through whom all his descendants would come, a great nation, from whom all the nations of the world would be blessed, this son. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And I wonder to myself, was Isaac still imploring bewilderedly, Father, but where's the lamb? Was Abraham still answering, God will provide? And then we read, Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. Incredible. Is this what faith looks like? The book of Hebrews in the New Testament gives us a glimpse into what was in Abraham's heart. It says in Hebrews 11, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And then it says this, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. God tested Abraham. And faith, which is far more precious than gold, was proved, was refined, and was purified. And so with his hand raised, we read verse 11, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Was it fear? Or faith. You know, why does the angel say, now I know that you fear God? Let it just be said, or, this could be another sermon, so I'm not going to preach that one, but faith and fear do not in any way contradict each other. Luther grasped this so well and said it so well, I think, in the very simple explanations he gives to the Ten Commandments, which you're probably familiar with. But he would say, he would start out his explanations, we should fear and love God so that we may not do what we shouldn't do. The first commandment is what? You shall have no other gods before me. And Luther's explanation was simply this. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. In one perfectly coherent response of faith are combined fear, love, and trust. 
So as we embark down the road leading to Calvary again this year during the season of Lent, I pray that we can, can hold on to, to this text. Let it roll around in our minds and in our hearts, meditate on it, and marvel at especially these, these words that the angel spoke at the culmination of the event on that mountain. When it was said, For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You know, there are so many pointers to, the, to God's unfolding plan of salvation To the coming of the one, the only beloved Son of the Father of all mankind, the seed of the, the woman that was promised, the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the son of David, and all the, the other generations, until people started, wait, after waiting so long, started doubting is there any truth to this? But one day, the promised Son was born. But then, we see the father leading his son up the hill. Placing a cross on his shoulders to offer a sacrifice. Laid on the wood of the tree. The sacrifice was prepared. But who was there to call out, stop! Stop! No voice called out. No voice from heaven called out, stop. As Isaiah said in another amazing testimony to the validity of Scripture, 700 years before Christ came, we read these words, Who would believe our report? We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. No voice cried out that day, stop. As the nails were driven into his hands, as the cross was raised, as the blood poured forth, as the sacrifice was made. It was, in fact, just as Abraham said and trusted, God himself will provide the lamb. We close with the words of Romans that describe so clearly why this one and only beloved son was not spared. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.